Whether you feel we went to the moon or not, the important thing to remember is that in the Apollo 1 fire, three men lost their lives. And for those three men, we here at JW Studios offer a moment of silence. February 20th, 1962. John Glenn Jr., a member of NASA's original group of astronauts, boards his Mercury capsule, designated Friendship 7. It is the first manned launch of a Mercury capsule atop an Atlas booster rocket. Unreliable test launches of the Atlas had previously reduced NASA to launch their astronauts atop Werner von Braun's old Redstone rockets, just to get them as far as suborbital flight. All right, uh, lift off and the clock is started. If successful, this would make John Glenn the first American to orbit the Earth. You've got speed, John Glenn. Glenn's flight would be the sixth in the Mercury Atlas launch. The third Mercury was saved by its launch escape tower as its Atlas booster exploded. The first Mercury capsule launched by an Atlas rocket wasn't so lucky. Uh, Roger, this is Liberty Bell 7, the clock is operating. On the previous manned flight, Virgil Gus Grissom, America's second man in space, was nearly drowned when the explosive bolts holding his hatch down blew accidentally and flooded Liberty Bell 7. Across the United States, citizens watched eagerly to see an American take that extra step into orbit. Viewers of this historic mission were no doubt totally unaware that NASA were prepared to take total advantage of the possible fatality that came with Glenn's mission. February 2nd, 1962. 18 days before the launch of Friendship 7, William H. Craig of the CIA presented a document to General Edward Lansdale of the Department of Defense. The document was titled, Possible Actions to Provoke, Harass or Disrupt Cuba. It proposed spreading anti-Castro propaganda and staging terrorist attacks on American soil, which they could use to justify military intervention into Cuba, to wage war against Fidel Castro's Communist Party. This CIA document became public domain when it was declassified by the Assassination Records Review Board in 1998. In total, there were 12 false flag attacks proposed. The seventh one was called Operation Dirty Trick. It proposed a playing chance with John Glenn's life, that if the Mercury Atlas 6 launcher exploded with the potential loss of astronaut life, the US could then accuse the Cubans of toppling their Cape Canaveral rockets. The objective is to provide irrevocable proof that, should the Mercury manned orbit flight fail, the fault lies with communist exile Cuba. This is to be accomplished by manufacturing various pieces of evidence which would prove electronic interference on the part of the Cubans. It seems that not only were the United States willing to let their astronauts die, but the very previous proposal, Operation Cover-Up, revealed that they were going to go as far of upping Glenn's chances of dying. The objective is to convince the communist government of Cuba that naval forces ostensibly assigned to the Mercury project is merely a cover. It should not be revealed as to what the cover is. This should be left to conjecture. This could tie in with Operation Dirty Trick. 
In other words, the US would go as far as spreading false rumors about the launch to try and trick the Cubans into actually bombing the spacecraft for real, which would further put John Glenn's life at risk. Put simply, both NASA and the US military were willing to sacrifice John Glenn's life not for the good of mankind and the benefit of astronomy, but so they could use his death to justify the killing of thousands of innocent people in their insane lust for power over Cuba. Just as the Bush administration used the 9-11 attacks to justify their attacks in Iraq and Afghanistan. During the second orbit, detection of a loose heat shield made certain that the US had a 50-50 chance of getting the loss of life they were hoping for. With this in mind, would it be wrong to say that the idea of NASA murdering its own astronauts is far from being a loathsome accusation? In February 2007, Phil Plate, the webmaster for Bad Astronomy, wrote in to say that he was tempted to call me a liar for saying that his and Jay Windley's respective websites do little more than attack the messenger rather than attack the message. You know, Renee and these other guys, they've never lifted a finger to do any real research. They make these claims, they beat their chests, and they're wrong. They're wrong. I reminded him that he never bothered to lift a finger to disprove the charges that the Apollo 1 crew were murdered. And I asked Phil Plate why he wouldn't comment on Operation Dirty Trick. Plate never responded. This was the first in as many as 10 requests over 2007 asking Phil Plate to comment on Operation Dirty Trick. So far, he has not answered one of them, and the reminders of this false flag attack continue to pile up. The crew intended to be the first to pilot an Apollo spacecraft comprised of astronauts Virgil Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chaffee. Chaffee had never flown in space before. As a member of the third group of astronauts, he had been selected from the US Navy. He held the rank of Lieutenant Commander. During that time, he served at Heavy Photographic Squadron 62, and was best known for flying photo reconnaissance missions during the Cuban Missile Crisis. White was America's first spacewalker, and for a long time, the Guinness Book of Records and even NASA recognized him as the world's first man to walk in space. Okay, I'm coming over. It looks beautiful. I feel like a million dollars. He was a member of the next nine and had been selected as a US Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. Like the Russian supposedly before him, his spacesuit had overinflated whilst walking in space. But White was probably an even greater danger, as unlike Leonov, he had no way of deflating his spacesuit. Grissom, a veteran astronaut of the original Mercury 7, had become NASA's first astronaut to return to space, flying both Liberty Bell 7 and Gemini 3. On, your way, Molly Brown. Oh, man. on both his flights, Grissom had escaped from the jaws of death. On Mercury, the explosive bolts of his Liberty Bell capsule separated prematurely and flooded the capsule cabin, sinking it. NASA for some time had tried to blame Grissom for the loss of the capsule, stating that he panicked and pulled the release prematurely. These charges were unfounded. In the, in the first uh, accident he had with the, uh, with the missions, yeah, they indeed. blamed him. Well, because he was always shooting his mouth off. And it was all his fault that the guy they didn't think sank. No, it was the frogman's fault. They didn't get the, uh, the buoy strapped onto it quick enough. On Gemini, Grissom was nearly killed too. As Michael Collins recalls in Carrying the Fire, Grissom had cracked his visor open against the dashboard during re-entry. On NASA's own website, one comes across the following vivid information regarding his role in the Apollo program and his stance on it. 